Hello students, this is Herbert Chase, Professor of Clinical Medicine and Biomedical Informatics, and I oversee the Biomedical Informatics thread at Columbia, and I'm going to present an overview of the discipline. As you well know, probably better than most, that there's been a dramatic increase in the use of technology, and especially in healthcare. Um, although we're honestly at the very beginning of the um, use of technology in healthcare, although there has clearly been a dramatic uh, improvement in the technology, but there's a long way to go. And the expectation, of course, is that technology is going to improve the efficiency and outcomes of healthcare. Now, how this is going to come about and when this will come about fully, no one knows, but I do know that you will be a part of this technology revolution. We're at the very beginning of the revolution, and I think you're going to have uh, fun and excitement, uh, an incredible experience in developing, hopefully some of you will develop the technology and use the technology to improve the health of our patients. To prepare you for the current and future health information technology revolution, we have developed a curricular thread in biomedical informatics uh, at Columbia, which I'll describe in detail at the end of this presentation. But first, what is biomedical informatics? At its core, biomedical informatics is the discipline which explores how using technology and biomedical data can improve healthcare outcomes. Seems simple enough. There's a computer sitting on top of the biomedical data, and uh, the computer seeks to make sense of the biomedical data and uh, help the physician practice better medicine, maybe help the patient practice better uh, health uh, habits. Let's take a brief look at all the biomedical data that's out there. Well, there's patient data. There's patient data in the healthcare system, such as the electronic health record, the laboratory values the patient has, the chest x-rays the patient has, uh, follow-up visits, what the doctor says in the notes. Then there are patient portals. These are becoming increasingly popular. I have my own uh, where I access my own data and I can get information and I can put in information. Uh, there are web blogs where patients uh, share stories. Uh, there's patients like me uh, where patients share stories. Uh, this is an incredibly rich source of biomedical data. The Department of Public Health also has its source of data. Think of all the things it monitors and we're going to talk a little bit about that later. Uh, and is a, a rich source of data uh, that can be used to uh, monitor the health of our population, uh, as well as individual patients. Industry and pharma have data. Uh, gosh, I think CVS has a better recollection of the medicines I'm taking than I do. Uh, they store and actually sell plenty of data to the pharma industry. And lastly, but this is certainly not a complete list, there's the medical information that's out there for us to use as practitioners. There's PubMed or Medline, which is the uh, library for every single article that's ever been published in medicine over the last 50 years. Uh, this is where we draw the evidence from which we make our decisions uh, in the care, uh, diagnosis and care of patients. Webs, on the web, there are also specialty societies. The American Society of Nephrology has its list of guidelines. So the amount of data, the quality and the types of data out there are vast, and biomedical informatics basically uh, explores the use of this data to improve healthcare outcomes. There are several areas of focus of biomedical informatics, and we're going to talk about each of them during this presentation. And there's clinical informatics, which is focused on improving the health of the individual patient. And some of the examples of clinical informatics are building decision support tools for the provider, such as reminders and checklists. There's public health informatics, which is focused on improving the health of populations and communities. And one of the examples I'll cite in a bit is syndromic surveillance, where we monitor for syndromes, such as the flu, uh, circulating and around the world. There's translational informatics, which seeks to link basic science and clinical practice. And as an example, I'm going to talk about drug-drug interactions uh, and discovering uh, novel ones. 
And, and lastly, uh, a, a major focus of biomedical informatics is computational biology, relying, excuse me, identifying individual molecules responsible for health and disease. And we'll, as an example, I'll talk uh, a bit about the molecular basis of schizophrenia. Now let's look at each of these topics in some depth. Let's return to the first area of interest, clinical informatics. The major goal of clinical informatics is to improve the health of the individual patient by assisting the providers using the clinical data stored in the electronic health record. Uh, the lofty goal is accomplished through the design, the development, and implementation of state-of-the-art clinical systems, including the EHR and clinical decision support. So decision support uh, is the future of clinical informatics uh, in, in, in many regards, and it's to provide the clinician with the tools to help the patient. A simple example of uh, decision support and clinical informatics is uh, the reminder for the HPV vaccine, human papillomavirus. It is clear from many studies that patients who are aged between 9 and 26 who should be getting uh, the HPV vaccine are not getting the vaccine. Uh, this can be life-saving, literally. It has almost no risk, as far as I know. Uh, and uh, one approach to improving the vaccination rate is to add a prompt to the electronic health record. Patient comes in, doctor opens the EHR, a little button or a little window opens, and there's a prompt saying the patient hasn't had the vaccine. So a prompt can have a big impact. Uh, again, this would be an example of decision support and clinical informatics. Another example is a checklist for chronic kidney disease. Uh, checklists are, are equally effective uh, as prompts. Uh, a patient with chronic kidney disease uh, has an electronic health record tab, which might look something like this. The patient has uh, uh, various lab data shown that reflect the kidney function, and then there's a series of recommendations for the preceptor, or excuse me, for the provider to uh, pursue. Patients anemic, better check iron, better check B12, better check folate. You know, very smart people uh, often forget to do things, uh, and checklists are very helpful. And for those of you who have not read Atul Gawande's book, The Checklist Manifesto, I recommend it highly. Next is public health informatics. The focus of public health informatics is mainly on populations and communities. Uh, obviously, that spills over to the effects on individual patients. There are major challenges faced by public health system which require informatic solutions. Some examples are protecting us against biological terrorism, natural infectious disease threats, or tackling life's um, excuse me, lifestyle-related epidemics such as obesity and tobacco use. One good example, I think, of public health informatics is tracking Zika. Uh, residents in Florida were quite concerned about the northern spread of Zika and kept abreast of the disease through bulletins released by the CDC. How did the CDC track uh, Zika? By reports that were coming in, it was added to the database, they were crunching the numbers. They were looking at the number of case, uh, and, and new cases uh, in a geographical uh, area. And through that, they could make some predictions about where Zika was going to be next. Uh, sophisticated informatics are critical for the person who might be pregnant and is thinking of traveling or lives in an area which was going to be in the path of Zika. Another example that we've already touched on in, uh, of public health informatics is syndromic surveillance monitoring for the appearance of syndromes. Uh, and the syndromes, of course, can be infectious syndromes. Uh, they could be um, uh, cancer uh, syndromes. They could be even uh, you know, autoimmune syndromes. The point is that the CDC and public health informatics uh, infrastructure could theoretically collect data from all these sources and integrate them into a very uh, in a very complicated uh, but robust system to enable uh, researchers to look at trends and then be able to guide the practitioner. So I, I'm on the um, 
email list from the New York State Department of Health, and I'm constantly getting emails about uh, the appearance of a particular syndrome or a concern, uh, and that, of course, is the result of their data crunching of all the information represented on this slide. Um, huge amount of information, and only a computer, honestly, can grapple with that. Let's move on to another area of interest of biomedical informatics is translational bioinformatics. The goal is to convert basic science discoveries into clinically applicable knowledge. Researchers in translational bioinformatics leverage a wide range of biomedical data, from gene sequencing data to millions of electronic records, and they seek to develop predictive models to analyze and understand health and disease. Let's look at an example of translational bioinformatics, the discovery of drug-drug interactions. A typical 65-year-old patient takes, on average, seven drugs a day. That results in at least 20 drug-drug combinations. So what are the hazards of taking um, several drugs, uh, and what are the implications of the fact that many of these drug-drug interactions have potential lethality, literally? So the translational bioinformatics teams look for novel drug-drug interactions. My colleague Nick Tatanetti in the department has made the following observations. He has found that drug A has no effect on normal conduction, the heart, you know, the electrical system. Drug B, in and of itself, taken alone, has no effect on normal conduction. And yet, when drug A and B are taken together, it causes prolonged QT, which has the potential of leading to sudden death. Long QT syndrome does is known to lead to sudden death. And what's interesting about this, and, and I think alarming, is that there's no a priori reason to think that each of these drugs, when given together, uh, would cause prolonged QT. There's no theoretical basis uh, known at the time. And so by mining huge amounts of data, uh, Nick was able to make this observation. And the two drugs that he found are commonly used. This is what's troubling about this. First of all, the, the Prevacid, uh, Lansoprazole, is an over-counter med which means that a patient can walk into the pharmacy, buy Prevacid, and be taking Prevacid on a daily basis without the physician knowing and without anybody knowing. And then, let's say they're admitted to the hospital that needs ceftriaxone for an infection, and they may or may not tell their doctor that they took Prevacid that morning, and the combination can lead to sudden death. Uh, this is very important, uh, and as mentioned, there's so many drugs that patients take. Uh, there's a huge field now, a complete discipline, if you will, looking for drug-drug interactions. The last area of interest is computational biology. Computational biologists focus on individual molecules. They use advanced methods from mathematics, physics, statistics, and computer science to develop statistical and analytic models capable of predicting biological activity. It's a fascinating area. Uh, you know, we're, we're learning what the causes of uh, illness and health are, you know, gene and molecule by gene and molecule. One example uh, that's recently come to light is the genetic basis of schizophrenia. If you know, for many years, uh, we knew that there was a genetic basis of schizophrenia, uh, as seen in higher incidence in identical twins and lesser so in fraternal twins and children, etc., but the molecular basis was unknown. But Dennis Vitkup in our department has identified many important gene, uh, proteins that could be involved in schizophrenia. And these are association studies are done with you know, many patients and looking at their um, genetic profiles and the proteins that they make. And these are all targets of potential uh, causes of schizophrenia. What's exciting about this is that by knowing some of these targets or some of these players, one can develop uh, diagnoses, uh, diagnostic tools, and one can also possibly develop you know, therapeutic strategy. So let's review. What are the areas of biomedical informatics that we've gone over? We talked about clinical informatics, and our examples were reminders and checklists. These help the provider improve the care of an individual patient.
is public health informatics. Uh, we track Zika through the CDC, uh, pull data from all over the country, and if not all over the world, put it into a black box, shake it, stir it, and then figure out where Zika is going to be next based on predictive model. We have translational biomedical informatics, or excuse me, translational bioinformatics, uh, where we identify new drug-drug interactions. Um, take um, many data sources, uh, put in thousands of patients, thousands of drugs, look for associations, find the associations, and the next thing you know, the drug-drug interaction that is going to be harmful is going to be built into the electronic health record through clinical informatics, and that will prevent doctors from giving those two drugs to the same patient at the same time. Lastly, there's computational biology, genetic basis of schizophrenia, uh, as we saw, and uh, this approach uh, of looking for the genetic basis of uh, illness is being applied to virtually any disease that you can think of. So what is a good definition of biomedical informatics? Now that we've sort of run the gamut and seen uh, what the broad scope of the discipline is, well, at, at its core, it is a discipline that focuses on the acquisition, maintenance, retrieval, and analysis of biomedical information. And as we've seen, the sources and the kinds of uh, data which constitute biomedical information is quite broad. And we use this information to improve patient care. Also, down the road, if not already, medical education and certainly health sciences research. And what do they all have in common? What they have in common is a computational approach to biomedical data. We've, uh, we've obtained the data, we've stored it, now we have it to analyze, and we use all sorts of different uh, programs or different approaches to make sense of that data. It could be uh, modeling data, uh, predictive modeling, it could be simple um, looking for uh, uh, patterns, uh, it could be creating a network from the data so that we see what's related to what, um, whatever the question being asked requires in methods. There is probably a method available in, in the computational and science uh, area. So that's biomedical informatics. And now I'd like to just say uh, something about our biomedical informatics thread at Columbia. We have a four-year biomedical informatics thread uh, that for the medical students uh, corresponds to the three phases of the curriculum, the preclinical curriculum, the major clinical year, and the differentiation and integration year. We have lectures and workshops, and we also have videos, some of which are under construction and projects. As for lectures and workshops, we've got uh, lectures this uh, year. We have artificial intelligence in medicine, which um, I'm giving in December. You've either heard it or you have uh, you're waiting to hear it uh, and uh, you're also watching this video which is an introduction to biomedical informatics and the overview uh, next year uh, during second year I'll give a talk on best resources to find evidence uh, evidence-based medicine is our the basic principle of the way we practice medicine and there are good resources for you to use out there to find that best evidence there during the third year, um, excuse me, well, third year, phase two of the major clinical year, we'll have the talk on clinical informatics, actually a workshop, uh, where we'll talk about uh, some nifty points of the, uh, the EHR, where you can uh, find uh, ways to better manage your patient. And we'll also talk about security and privacy. Uh, and then there's some videos, which I haven't made yet, frankly, on meaningful use and privacy and security. And you'll, you'll know what meaningful use is um, by the end of uh, the third year, hopefully. And lastly, during the phase three, we have one session at the Ready for Residency course, right before you go out the door on decision analysis and evidence-based medicine. And then during the entire uh, phase three differentiation and integration, you can take an elective in biomedical informatics, uh, we have uh, every year we have several students who do so. You can make your own project, uh, build a gizmo, program something, do uh, predictive modeling, whatever you feel like doing. And we also have students who do scholarly projects with us on various topics. 
So I'd like to thank you for listening to this podcast, uh, and we look forward to uh, seeing you and uh, hearing from you. Um, I will mention that I am preparing a podcast on research opportunities, and I hope to have that to you as soon as I can, uh, certainly before you apply for your summer fellowship stipend. Thank you.